grocery shoppers that just never seems to end. Waiting it out in the abnormally freezing temperatures to try to stock up after so many have lost power. That's if there's anything left on those shelves. Another round of the dangerous record-breaking weather hitting parts of the country that simply aren't used to dealing with these frigid temperatures. The power grid strained across more than a dozen states, millions left without heat, with more heavy snow and ice on the way. Ginger tells us where and when. Deadly tornadoes, five twisters reported in three states, at least three people killed as the storm struck in the middle of the night. Emergency crews now searching for more possible victims. FEMA opens its first mass vaccination site today while other sites shut down due to shortages. The White House with a new promise to increase distribution as President Biden makes the case for his $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. Stuck in political purgatory for decades, why hasn't the Equal Rights Amendment become law? Meant to guarantee equality regardless of sex or gender. Many asking, what's the holdup? Do you think this is the moment it's going to happen? I think this is the moment it's going to happen. Notre Dame reborn. After the devastating fire that nearly destroyed the iconic Parisian cathedral, we give you a behind-the-scenes look at the incredible progress being made in restoring the treasure. Okay, it's been 25 years since I've done this. And after all of these years, why Adam Sandler has finally returned to his happy place. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is being called a nightmare scenario. Tonight, millions are without power as bone-chilling winter weather is taking its toll in parts of the country where residents are simply not accustomed to this kind of frigid air. And this cold grip is taking hold for an extended period. At least 16 people have died. Dozens more are dealing with carbon monoxide poisoning after resorting to desperate measures to try to stay warm. And there is new concern now about the next storm that's already on its way. Way. Texas bearing the brunt of the extreme cold and as temperatures plunge again, millions remain in the dark right now without heat for a second straight night. The utility company says they have no idea when the power will be back on. And serious questions tonight about this image and the rolling blackouts as residents were left in the dark and cold. Why was the Houston skyline lit up? Tonight, officials across the South are urging residents to stay home and off of the treacherous icy roads. And extreme weather is halting vaccinations across the South. Our Marcus Moore leads us off tonight. Tonight, millions without power for a second day in Texas, and the death toll is rising. In Galveston County, officials are preparing for the worst, asking the state to bring in refrigerated trucks that can hold as many as 50 bodies. We're not projecting anything, but I'm afraid that I don't have a whole lot of room for optimism here. The coldest temperatures in parts of the state in more than 100 years is bursting pipes and damaging homes while families shiver inside. In Houston, a woman and an eight-year-old girl dying of carbon monoxide poisoning after a car was left running in a garage to help generate heat. A man and a seven-year-old boy taken to the hospital. I know it's cold, but uh, you got to be careful about using, like, say, generators or a car inside a garage or uh, any type of uh, fire, uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, it's, it's odorless and it can kill people very easily. Houston hospitals treating at least 140 patients. Six people from one family among them, a mother and a child in critical condition. They were heating charcoals indoors to stay warm. And in Sugarland, a grandmother and her three grandchildren died in a house fire overnight. The cause is under investigation. Back in Houston, frozen hydrants hindering firefighters as they battled the flames at an apartment, forced to rely on water in their trucks for a time. And tonight, outrage over the outages and images like these showing Houston skyscrapers lit up while much of the city was blacked out. Yesterday, no one imagined that more than 24 hours people would be still be without power. Governor Abbott calling for the state to investigate power officials. This is the winter version of Hurricane Harvey, and we will learn from this also. This is the line to get into H-E-B. Long lines for food and supplies at the restaurants and stores that are open. Here in Dallas, Alexander Troop says he hasn't eaten a hot meal in three days. This is tragic. 
This is this is worse than the pandemic because people are stuck in their homes right now. This as the extreme conditions are straining the power grid across the region. Rolling blackouts now happening in at least 14 states that share the grid with Texas. And at least 19 states have had to halt vaccinations and COVID testing because of the harsh conditions. Here in Texas, deliveries won't even begin arriving until tomorrow. And even then, delivery will be subject to conditions because there's another storm arriving tonight. No rest for the weary. Marcus Moore joins us now from Dallas. Marcus, the extreme cold really taking its toll tonight. One resident that you spoke with said that he actually considered writing his own obituary last night. Yeah, yeah, Lindsay, it was, that was such a, a remarkable and, and really moving and, and uh, unsettling statement. And I feel like he meant, he meant it 100%. This is a guy who's lived in Dallas most all his life. He's 65 years old and he lives in an apartment building uh, with four other people and it's all electric. So when the power is out, they have absolutely nothing. At least some of the places here in Dallas that while there's no power, they still at least have gas. So there's the potential to uh, have a hot meal. But he said he hasn't had a hot meal in three days and he is ready for the power to come back and for all this ice and snow uh, to melt. Yeah, we can imagine that. And you also mentioned last night that that vaccine shortage facility in Harris County that lost power and the rush to give out those 8,400 vaccines, were they able to use the majority of those doses? Uh, Lindsay, they were. We, we heard from Harris County officials and they, they were able to administer more than 5,400 of those vaccines. And we saw a striking image of, of people lined up outside Rice University where they gave out 1,000 of those vaccines. And they did receive guidance from Moderna that the unused doses uh, could be re-refrigerated to be stored for a later date. So they plan to do that. But at this point, Lindsay, uh, the operations there to administer vaccines have been suspended because of the current weather conditions. And yeah, we can see your breath. It's just that cold in Dallas, Texas. Marcus, our thanks to you. And while multiple areas from the Great Plains to the Gulf Coast have been dealing with these freezing temperatures, some southern states were dealt a double winter whammy after the President's Day storm also brought tornadoes. Let's bring in ABC's Victor Kendo, who's in North Carolina, where they've been hit by some deadly tornadoes there. Victor, what's the latest? Lindsay, the damage here in Brunswick County, North Carolina, caused by that same system that hit Texas, but here it was an EF3 tornado, winds up to 160 miles per hour. You can see that the walls and the roof of this warehouse were peeled right off, and this all happened in the dead of night. Let's take you to some images from above the neighborhood right behind us here. This twister just tore through these Ocean Isle Beach homes. At least three people were killed, 10 more injured. The county sheriff saying he's never seen anything like this, and this was just one of five reported tornadoes on Another one hit southwest Georgia. That was at least an EF2. More homes destroyed and damaged there. And there is more severe weather on the way tomorrow and into Thursday. And this warehouse, by the way, Lindsay, it's an electrical and plumbing supply shop. So for the folks who will need rebuilding, they'll be coming here first. So the guys that we spoke with, the workers here tell us they hope that the damage done to their shop won't slow down the response time by too much. Lindsay. Our hearts go out to those families. Victor Kendo, thanks so much. So much going on on the weather front, and there is more dangerous weather still ahead. So let's get right to our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, with what is next. Ginger, what can we expect? All right, Lindsay, we started this morning by breaking and smashing all time cold records, not just like cold for the day, but from Nebraska through Arkansas down to New Orleans, where they did indeed have their coldest kickoff to Mardi Gras on record. It was no fun and it looks like no fun on the maps. So let me go ahead and start you out with the brand new warnings. That is not a repeat map. It's not something from the archives. No, it's all brand new winter storm warnings that include Oklahoma City and Fayetteville and Fort Smith and down to Shreveport and certainly Dallas is getting included there all the way over to Memphis. The winter storm watches now extend into the northeast and so it's all the same next storm. I have to time it out for you. It'll really help. Uh, there is a reinforcing shot of cold air with this. That's how you get the frozen precipitation. But look, Dallas just picked up more snow than they'd had in a decade. Well, they're going to get more on top of that. Oklahoma doing that too as they try in Oklahoma City to close it on their snowiest season on record. The ice will move through the north through the southeast and right on the bottom side of it. We know that this has 
the potential to also uh, create thunderstorms that could be not just with damaging winds, but tornadoes from the Florida Panhandle back to even New Orleans. So we'll be watching that in the coming days, but it's the snowy northern side, the ice in the mid-Atlantic that starts on Thursday, goes through Thursday night, and then by Friday, we will see a lot of places that got a couple of fresh inches of snow transitioning back to rain. But this is a big deal. I mean, we started with the Snow and Ice Center tracking how much snow covers this nation back in 2003. Right now, we've got 73% coverage, something we've never seen wow. since those records began and more on the way. Yeah, and, and so much for Fat Tuesday. It's really become Frigid Tuesday. And we've also been talking so much frigid. about how <laughs> the, the cold and, and the other winter conditions just aren't felt normally like this traditionally in the southern half of the U.S. But is there a feeling that it could eventually become more of the norm? Well, that's the thing is when we talk about extremes, and actually I'll have a whole special on this uh, later this week on ABC News Live for It's Not Too Late. You have to realize that even when you have extreme cold, that can be a symptom of a changing climate. So we'll explain a whole lot more. So talk to some climatologists from Minnesota and some folks who are living it all around the world. And as you said, we will have much more on that later on in the week in your series. It's not too late. Ginger, thank you so much. Stay warm. And now to the COVID vaccination race. FEMA opened up its first mass vaccination sites in California with additional federal sites expected to open up next week in Texas and also New York. The goal is to set up 100 of these federal centers nationwide. What Dr. Anthony Fauci is now saying about when most Americans will likely get their shot and the new warnings about those COVID variants. ABC's Kaylee Hartung is in Los Angeles where she spoke today with Governor Gavin Newsom. Tonight, FEMA and the National Guard opening the first federal mass vaccination sites in Los Angeles and Oakland. It's organized that there's a plan. We're moving forward. As officials push to vaccinate hard hit minority communities, this location aiming to reach up to 6,000 residents a day. Additional vaccine supply going to these federal sites separate from the state's allotment. Vaccine shortage has already forced California to temporarily shut down locally run sites from LA to San Francisco. There's been a lot of frustration and a lot of confusion. So where is that communication breakdown? It's look, it's difficult when you're a size of 21 states population combined. California. I mean, it's even more magnified than in some other states that are going through similar things. Despite the challenges, an average of 1.6 million vaccines a day are now being administered across the country. And tonight, the White House announcing it will double the doses going out to 7,000 pharmacies and modestly increase supply to states to 13 and a half million doses a week. But widespread availability and herd immunity still months away. Let's say in May, vaccines are going to be widely available to almost anybody. May June, but it may take till June, July, and August to finally get everyone vaccinated. The U.S. reports its lowest number of cases since October, but experts warn a new wave could be coming, fueled by uncontrolled variants. More than 1,100 cases of those reported across at least 42 states. That's something that I think everybody has to be even more cautious about. And it's nice to see the numbers of cases drop, but it could be misleading. Lots of concern about those variants. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. And Kaylee, there seems to be a shifting timeline for when most Americans can be vaccinated. Why is that? Yeah, well, Lindsay, it turns out, as Dr. Fauci is telling us, Johnson & Johnson will now be producing fewer doses than they had based earlier estimates on. So it was just last week that Dr. Fauci was saying uh, most Americans, adults who'd want a vaccine could get one by April. He's now saying it could be June, July, maybe even August before that happens. And you're also at that FEMA vaccination site in L.A. What have you heard from people on the ground there? Oh, Lindsay, just as we hear at any vaccination site, relief, a tremendous sense of relief. And here where you have FEMA, the National Guard, the U.S. Army and the state of California all working together to run this site. Uh, we've heard a lot of appreciation from folks who say this process has been run with military efficiency. There's been a lot of frustration, as we've heard, a lot of confusion as people have looked where to get appointments, how to register online. But everyone I spoke to today said this process ran pretty seamlessly, uh, which is which is wonderful to hear considering they vaccinated about 3,000 people today. Wow, and feeling relieved. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. Next, President Biden is putting his focus squarely on coronavirus relief as he travels to hard hit Wisconsin. His nearly $2 trillion package isn't getting much Republican support in Congress. So it appears that the president is now attempting to make his case on the road with a direct appeal right to the American people. Here's ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce. 
President Biden tonight hitting the road, heading to Wisconsin to sell his nearly $2 trillion COVID relief plan. The bill extends unemployment benefits, provides $160 billion for vaccinations and testing, help for small businesses, and would give lower income Americans a $1,400 check. For millions, like Alicia Carter, a postal worker in Baltimore, Washington simply isn't doing enough. A mother with five daughters, she's struggling to make ends meet. And it hurts to be a, a, a provider for your family and you can't do it. And you guys have the need, the, the means to do it. And you're not. Republicans in Congress say Biden's plan is just too expensive, but the White House is pointing to polls showing it has widespread support, including from a significant chunk of Republican voters. That uh, should be an indication or should be noted by member of Congress, uh, members of Congress as they consider whether they're going to vote for it or not. So is he hoping then that these visits will help build pressure on members of Congress? Uh, no, obviously Republicans in Congress will have to make their own choice. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. And Mary, it seems like at this point, President Biden is taking his COVID relief plans directly to Americans. He is. He'll be in Wisconsin tonight, of course, a key swing state that helped deliver him the White House, but also a state that's been hardest hit by this pandemic. Joe Biden participating for the first time in a town hall, his first as president, taking questions directly from Americans about his COVID relief bill. And then on Thursday, he's continuing his outreach to Americans. He'll be in Kalamazoo, Michigan, another key political state that this time visiting a vaccine manufacturing plant. And again, trying to take this message outside of the beltway, outside of the halls of Congress directly to Americans who the White House continues to stress the vast majority want this bill, want this relief, and they, they've wanted it for quite some time, Lindsay. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. Next, three days after former President Trump was acquitted of incitement of a red insurrection in the impeachment trial, he's being sued for conspiring the January 6th siege on the Capitol. The case brought by the House Homeland Security Chairman and the NAACP names Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and extremist groups, the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. In the case, ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the details. Tonight, as video with more vantage points of that violent insurrection is released, the first major lawsuit targeting President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and a number of right-wing groups accused of participating in the riot. Clearly organized insurrection is breaching the Capitol. Today, Senator Ron Johnson drawing outrage from Democrats, suggesting that even with all the videos showing attacks on Capitol Police, that there wasn't an armed insurrection at all, saying on The Jay Weber Show. This didn't seem as an, like an armed insurrection to me. When you think here of armed, don't you think of firearms? In that new lawsuit, the NAACP and prominent Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson lay blame for the riot at the feet of President Trump, Giuliani, and groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, citing the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act, which bans any actions designed to prevent Congress from carrying out its duties. A spokesman for the former president dismissed the lawsuit, saying President Trump did not incite or conspire to incite any violence at the Capitol. Today, the White House said President Biden supports a 9-11-style commission to investigate the attack. And we learned the first congressional hearing about security failures leading up to the assault will be next week. Lindsay? Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. And we are joined now by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Houston. Thank you so much for joining us, Congresswoman. Uh, I'd like to start with Thank the dire you. weather situation there where you are in Texas with many of your constituents dealing with the freezing cold and power outages of the last 24 hours. And, and I'd like to show an image that's drawn some outrage with the Houston skyline all lit up while residential areas there are dealing with rolling blackouts. Any sense on how this has happened and what's being done at this point to make sure uh, that power is being utilized appropriately during this weather emergency? Well, Lindsay, first of all, thank you for having me during these uh, very, very difficult times. Uh, I've been with local officials and they're equally outraged as I am, as those who might see it uh, are as well. You know, I call that just non-thinking persons. Uh, these are tall skyscrapers for our size city. Uh, they have management companies, uh, and uh, everyone likes to see their skyline. But in these difficult times, you should realize, and I think the picture shows, uh, that around those tall buildings are communities with mothers and fathers and children and senior citizens and people with critical needs who have absolutely no power. 
we've asked them to shut their power off, meaning turn their lights off and stop using uh, the power. We don't know, obviously, if people are in the buildings during the day, uh, people have to work. Uh, but this is absolutely, um, I believe, insensitive. And the mayor and other local officials uh, have asked for those uh, lights uh, to be off to conserve power because we have yet to be able to receive even an iota of information uh, from our state agency, which is ERCOT. And they may be working hard, but they're not communicating with local officials and or uh, just plain residents. Uh, and those individuals don't know the time or the hour when we might go on. That's why I'm working so hard to find alternative uh, resources to be able to help ERCOT, hopefully uh, to pull down energy to be able to use in the state. As millions of Texans start another night in the dark, I understand that you've reached out to the U.S. Department of Energy to provide assistance. But uh, Texas gets its power through private companies that supply ERCOT and that independent system that manages the flow of electricity in the state that you just mentioned. So I assume it's safe to say that you've not been satisfied with their response to this crisis. So what happens now? Well, I'm absolutely not satisfied. And what has now been highlighted is the very poor infrastructure and poor energy system that the state has. Well, who would know that? We know how to deal with hurricanes, uh, we know how to deal with uh, tornadoes, but who would know that? That in a state that is known for its energy, even uh, windmills, that our infrastructure is so poor. It's all at the feet of the state at this point. You may know that we're facing another weather uh, calamity tonight with more ice coming. We're just not used to it. And then we're trying to stand up our warming centers where people might be able to uh, feel comfortable in getting to before the storm comes again. Uh, we don't have it under control the way we would like to, but we want everybody to realize that we're not stopping until we can get some help and particularly get the power on. And wishing you all the best through this next uh, cold snap there. I want to turn back to, to Washington. You serve, of course, on the House Homeland Security Committee with Congressman Benny Thompson, who joined with the NAACP today to file suit against former President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and other groups that they claim were responsible for inciting the Capitol attack. How confident are you that these types of legal cases can be successful in holding the former president accountable for the attack, or could they also fall short? Well, Lindsay, I just want to uh, give you a heads up. There may be more lawsuits. I applaud the NAACP, its lawyers, and certainly Chairman Benny Thompson. Uh, I serve on that committee. I'm second in seniority. And uh, we were the leaders, including the chairman, on the question of white supremacy, white racism uh, for many years ago, a few years ago. And we were not listened to, frankly, um, as the first voices that talked about the rising threat of white nationalism, white supremacy, as it relates to domestic terrorism. It is tragic uh, that it culminated at the Citadel of Democracy on January 6th, led by now the former president of the United States. So I think this is an appropriate lawsuit. And no, I don't think uh, that it uh, has uh, the uh, total possibility of not prevailing. I think it has a good chance. Uh, you know, in the court of law, you look for justice. You look to be able to present your case. Most importantly, you hope that they will see that there should be a remedy. And lastly, you introduced legislation that would start a commission to study and develop plans on providing reparations for African Americans, which you'll have a hearing on tomorrow. Why do you feel that the timing for right now, that this is needed at this moment, and given the many pressing legislative items that the Biden administration and Democrats are pushing that could cost trillions of dollars, what do you say to those critics who say that this isn't the right time to push for reparations on top of all of that? I ask them the question, why? Uh, and I give them the phrase, why we can't wait. And I also uh, join with the Biden administration that says we can do many things at once. It's a healing factor. I don't look to do this tomorrow in this hearing in acrimony and anguish. I look to do it as a factual basis for moving this bill to the floor. And why is that? We're delighted to have representatives of the United Nations that will uh, explain that this is an international legal concept. It's not something we created here. It deals with restorative and repair, which is needed in this nation. And also this legislation answers this simple question. If you have uh, an African-American with a high school education and a white American with a high school education, that white American will have 10 times more wealth uh, than the African-American. We want to heal uh, and show the continuing disparities 
that have been and can be attributed uh, to the heinous act of bondage and slavery of individuals for all the, almost 200 years. It will be factually based. We'll have hearings. We'll put forward a report and proposals of how do you deal with the ongoing disparities that triggered uh, from as far back as slavery. We believe this is a healing moment in our country. This is a moment to say, I apologize. Let's see how we can move forward together. That's what H.R. 40 is all about. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, we hope that you and your constituents stay safe tonight. We thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me at this time. And when we come back, the investigation now underway after a deadly plane crash, the aircraft landing upside down in muddy water. Why a judge dismissed the charges against the woman who falsely accused a black man who was bird watching in Central Park of threatening her. But up next, women have borne the brunt of this pandemic. Millions left jobless, and now some are asking why the government has not passed the Equal Rights Amendment. That amendment to the Constitution was meant to fix some of the gender inequalities in our society. Our in depth look is coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. It's no secret that women in this country have been bearing the brunt of this pandemic. Millions are on the front lines at home, weathering the storm of closed schools, lost jobs, and growing hunger inside their families. The crisis is now adding fresh urgency to a near century old movement to shore up protections for women in the U.S. Constitution. So after a long fight, will the Equal Rights Amendment ever become part of the law of the land? Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. Nearly 50 years after Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment, There's still no mention of women in the U.S. Constitution. Do you think this marching is going to impress the men inside this building? Yes, I do, and I hope so, because now is the time. For decades, the ERA has been stuck in a political purgatory, just three states short of the 38 ratifications needed to make it official. Deadlines have come and gone. Women have kept marching. 
The language of the amendment is straightforward but far-reaching, stating that equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Advocates say those words are primed to finally become law at a critical time. Here we are 50 years later fighting the same battle all over again. I want to stop that. Professor Deepa Kumar says despite years of progress, gender discrimination is still very real. I was started off with a very good salary. And the problem, though, is that that salary level did not keep up. She was hired in 2004 as a professor at Rutgers University, the same school where in 1969 a young law professor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, won a settlement over unequal pay for female faculty. Kumar and four other women professors sued the school again last year. I mean, I felt like I'm being treated like a second-class citizen. It was hurtful. It was humiliating. If I could be treated this way, what about people who don't have job security? Rutgers would not comment on Kumar's case, but tells ABC News it's creating a new pay equity program and is committed to resolving outstanding pay equity requests as quickly and responsibly as possible. On average, women in the U.S. earn just 82 cents for every dollar earned by men, the gap even wider for women of color. Experts say the pandemic is threatening to make that pay inequality even worse. You look at what's happening with women across the, the workforce in this country right now because of COVID, women's, um, you know, if inequality has exacerbated. Um, you know, you look at the job loss for women. I mean, it is, you know, it is a palpable feeling. More than 2.3 million women have left the workforce since the pandemic began, including another 275,000 just last month. January marked the lowest labor force participation rate for women in more than 30 years. I was actually in the middle of feeding my daughter when this bill came up. California Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks became a symbol of the crisis last fall when she was forced to take her infant daughter to the state house floor in order to do her job. What you're going to see happening, I fear, is women coming out of the workforce because of the pandemic and their male counterparts are moving up in the ladder at work and they're moving down and then they're going to have to re-enter the workforce um, and they're going to be this far behind so that pay inequity will increase again over time. What do you think the fix is? And if we enshrine the ERA into the Constitution, that guarantees equity and equality for, for women across this country. Advocates argue the amendment would give a constitutional basis for women to fight back against pay inequality. It's very important, you know, to actually have law that allows women to challenge the injustice and the discrimination that they're facing so that, you know, it's equal pay for equal work for all. And it's not just the wage gap. The fact that in 30 of the 50 states, menstrual products are not exempt from sales tax because they're not deemed necessities. The so-called tampon tax has been banned by nearly a dozen other countries, but its persistence in the U.S. is still surprising to many. I have to tell you, I have no idea why states would tax these as luxury items. I, I suspect it's because men were making the laws yeah. when those tax were passed. So you're saying if you doubt gender inequality exists, look no further than the tampon tax. And most people, when they hear that, it, it forces almost anyone to go, hmm, I never thought about that. Why is that? Who, who decided that? Congress voted in 1972 with overwhelming bipartisan majorities to approve the ERA. 35 states quickly voted to ratify the amendment, but it wasn't until last year that Virginia became the final state required of a three-fourths majority to make it official. There was just one problem. Congress, in its infinite wisdom, decided to put a deadline on passing it. Very paternalistic. That deadline was in 1982, the ERA failing to hit the mark after conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly led a movement of women in opposition. I think some women like to blame sexism for their failures instead of admitting they didn't try hard enough. Her crusade immortalized in the FX series Mrs. America, Schlafly warning the ERA would upend American society, leading to women drafted into the military and end to restrictions on abortion and the elimination of gender designations for bathrooms. What I am against is a small, elitist group of Northeastern establishment liberals putting down homemakers. We have intractable problems that can only be solved by fixing the Constitution and really declaring 
that you cannot discriminate based on sex. Uh, and that's all that uh, this amendment says, and we've been working on it for 100 years. With Democrats in control in Washington and a record number of women in Congress, the movement sees a new opening. Congresswoman Jackie Speer of California and more than 200 lawmakers from both parties have sponsored a bill to remove the deadline for ERA ratification and allow it to become law. We do have momentum in a way that um, we haven't had probably um, for decades. Uh, there is no deadline on equality, and it's about time we recognize it. The Biden administration says enacting the ERA is a centerpiece of its agenda for women, but major legal hurdles still remain. A U.S. Justice Department analysis last year concluded that Congress may not revive a proposed amendment after the deadline has expired. Even Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg conceded before her death that the process would need to start over. The ERA fell three states short of ratification. I hope someday it will be put back in the political hopper, starting over again. Many ERA advocates argue that legal analysis is flawed. There are many constitutional scholars that argue that it's unconstitutional to put a deadline in a constitutional amendment. If this becomes the newest amendment, what happens? There has been discrimination. It's around pay. It's around pregnancy and it's around violence against women. So those are the areas that will be impacted. Is it your sense that some of the, the legal challenges that women have been bringing will continue to bring, would those cases be easier in effect if this was in the Constitution? Absolutely. Abs no question about it. A push to root out discrimination backed by the power of the Constitution. Do you think this is the moment it's gonna happen? I think this is the moment it's going to happen. As millions of American women say the time has come to get it done. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. No deadline on equality. Our thanks to Devin for that. Still ahead here on Prime, our exclusive look inside the work to bring one of the world's most famous churches, Notre Dame, back to life. It's an exclusive invite-only social app that is suddenly popping up everywhere. What you need to know about Clubhouse. And from frozen pants to frozen everything, this brutal winter is now a problem for people who are not used to these extremely cold temperatures. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the the day. Okay. Adam Sandler, or should I say Happy Gilmore, waiting 25 years after the release of his iconic movie to show Shooter McGavin a thing or two. Shooter McGavin, this is for you. And I'm not lying. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Four hours 
Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. We now take a closer look by the numbers at the record-breaking winter weather across the country, bringing some of the coldest air in recorded history. This as yet another storm moves in. Minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the frigid temperature in Dallas, Texas this morning, the coldest since 1949 and tied for the second coldest day since 1898. Oklahoma City hit minus 14 degrees. That was the coldest weather there since 1899. That city could also set a new record for the snowiest season ever. And Hastings, Nebraska was a brutal 30 degrees below zero today, tying for the all-time coldest temperature on record. Chicago has been pounded with nine straight days of snow. That also ties with the city record. And today, 38 states from Washington to Massachusetts are under winter weather alerts for snow, ice, and bitter cold. And a whopping 73% of the United States is now covered in snow. And at its peak, more than 4 million American homes in 13 states were without power. Still lots to get to tonight here on Prime. Saving Notre Dame, our exclusive look inside the mission to restore one of the world's most treasured landmarks. Mardi Gras may look different this year, but that doesn't mean people are not celebrating. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. More than 70 
80% of the continental U.S. is now covered in snow. Another storm moving into places like Oklahoma, where the capital recorded its coldest temperature in more than a century, negative 14 degrees. That system also threatening Texas, where record low temperatures... It's like a walk-in freezer. ...left more than 4 million people without power. Things will likely get worse before they get better. There's a high chance the power will be out for, for these folks until the weather gets better. Rolling blackouts now happening in at least 14 states that share the grid with Texas. And at least 19 states have had to halt vaccinations and COVID testing because of the harsh conditions. If the cold weather wasn't bad enough in North Carolina, officials say three people are dead and at least 10 are injured after a tornado tore through dozens of homes, leaving some destroyed. Tonight is video with more vantage points of that violent insurrection is released. The first major lawsuit targeting President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and a number of right-wing groups accused of participating in the riot. Clearly organized insurrection is breaching the Capitol, dressed in full military gear, including helmets and fatigues, moving in lockstep. In that new lawsuit, the NAACP and prominent Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson lay blame for the riot at the feet of President Trump, Giuliani, and groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, citing the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act, which bans any actions designed to prevent Congress from carrying out its duties. I'm the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Charges have been dismissed against the woman at the center of what has been come to know as the Central Park Bird Watcher case. Amy Cooper has completed a racial bias education program, which paved the way for the dismissal. Cooper had been charged with one count of filing a false police report. She was caught on tape, you may recall, last May, arguing with Christian Cooper, a black man who had been bird watching watching in the park and had asked her to put her dog on a leash. She then called the police, falsely claiming that he had tried to assault her. The DA's office later called the stunt racially offensive. The assistant DA says the outcome is consistent with other misdemeanor cases. Authorities are investigating a deadly plane crash in Rock County, Wisconsin. Two people on board were killed. The small plane went down shortly after takeoff, crashing into a wooded area near some homes, landing upside down in the mud and water. The pilot reported trouble just before the crash. Moments later, tower personnel saw the plane go down and immediately called 911. The NTSB is investigating. Clubhouse, it's the exclusive invite-only social networking app that's suddenly popping up everywhere. These little boxes that you see right here with a title and people within it are what's called rooms. In each of those rooms, users can be a fly on the wall, listening in on conversations and interviews on loads of topics, like a virtual dinner party on your phone. Clubhouse says it hit over 2 million weekly users within the last month. Oprah and Serena Williams have been heard on the app, and recently Elon Musk joining the club. Elon Musk, welcome to Clubhouse. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad thank to be you. here. Like all of social media, there are privacy considerations. My main privacy concern with Clubhouse is the fact that you have to give them your contact list on your phone in order to use the app. But that's not stopping tech titans from jumping in. Welcome back. The world certainly watched in horror nearly two years ago as the famed Notre Dame, nearly 1,000 years old, burned. But despite the pandemic, the restoration work has continued, and our James Longman has an exclusive look at the resurrection of this famous cathedral. Nearly two years ago, the world watched in horror as an emblem of French national pride and identity, Notre Dame, burned. As night fell on April 15th, 2019, the nightmare reached its climax. That famous spire crumbling into the ancient cathedral. Oh my God. The structure fragile, and despite a pandemic that shut down life as we know it, the work on rehabilitating this extraordinary place continued. Today, this historic treasure is slowly pulling through. And we went and saw firsthand. Here we go, Notre Dame. Good job. We were saying that if you walk past it, you wouldn't know there was anything wrong because the facade still looks as incredible as ever. Inside the nearly thousand year old cathedral, it's a different story. We head up to the roof where the destruction began. We're about 40 meters up here. 
The fire was started up here by an electrical fault high up in the vaulted ceiling. And this is what it did and where that famous spire fell. This is the most obvious damage to Notre Dame de Paris, the enormous hole that remains in the roof of the building. Take a look, you can see the charred ends of what was once the oak vault that kept this part of the roof in place. And it was those 200 tons of lead melting down on top of the roof here, the lead that once lined this roof, that caused this part of the roof to collapse. There are now anywhere between 150 to 200 people working on Notre Dame at any one time, slowed down, of course, by the pandemic. Here, workers dig for remains on the roof. All the old wood, stone and metal has to be taken out and analysed before they rebuild. Precious fragments handed over to archaeologists will see if there's anything they can salvage. Whatever can't be used in the restoration will be preserved to study the nearly 1,000-year-old structure. Back on the ground, debris is collected and brought into tents. In this one, restorators have collected the lead-filled beams that fell as Notre Dame burned. It's a huge operation and we're actually not even allowed into this part because they're so worried about lead inhalation. You need a specialised mask in order to go in. In another site, shelves lined with stones. So these are all the stones that were found on the floor of Notre Dame that fell during the fire. This up. Each one is meticulously placed in order to recreate the part of the structure that no longer stands. I asked the archaeologist what answers she hopes to find among the debris. She says there's much to discover. You think a building like this is really well known, but actually it's such an important building that no one dared touch it. The challenge, determining if these stones are structurally sound to be used in the restoration. Next door, a gargantuan task at hand. So you can see these stones look completely different and that's because they've been cleaned and prepared and placed over here, prepared to be placed over here, to recreate one of the arches from Notre Dame. Hopefully one day to then go back into the building. They're using a model from American art historian Andrew Tallon. He was the last person to properly map the vaulted ceilings of this part of Notre Dame in 2010. Because the originals are lost, his plans are the only ones the teams here can go by. Merci, les so how much is all this going to cost and how long will it take? The deputy of operations at Notre Dame was a little shy. <laughs> but it's clear this is an unprecedented project and the level of expertise and sheer number of skilled craftspeople it requires is staggering. We've gathered hundreds of stones from the first few days, thanks to the scientific community who mobilized the day right after the fire. Scientists, architects, archaeologists, they all volunteered to rehabilitate this structure. The one thing that's clear, everyone here is working, not just to restore a building, but to rebuild history. And France is waiting. James Longman in Paris for ABC News Live. Quite a task there. Our thanks to James for that inside look. And when we return, how New Orleans residents are transforming their homes into larger than life house floats. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. 
Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Finally tonight, it is Mardi Gras, and as you might expect, the pandemic is making the festivities a bit different. No parades, no crowds on Bourbon Street, but New Orleans is no stranger to taking it all in stride. The saying there goes everywhere else, it's just another Tuesday. On this Tuesday, the wildly creative city found a safe way to party on. Happy Mardi Gras! I'm Brian Batten. I'm coming to you live from my hometown, New Orleans. Now, usually, St. Charles Avenue would be filled with people and beautiful floats celebrating Mardi Gras, but due to COVID-19, we've had to adapt. Here we go, yeah! Yardi Gras is bringing Mardi Gras home since we can't celebrate on the streets in parades. We do porch floats where we convert porch into an actual float. You are gonna ride your float. Yeah. You're gonna ride it at your house and people yes. are gonna come to you. When the parades were officially canceled, by the city, I'd say about a third of the workers were immediately laid off. New Orleans loves its artists. Just house floats in general, the whole city is behind it. I mean, thousands of people are decorating. The Crew of Red Beans is a 12-year-old neighborhood marching parade for carnival here in New Orleans. Thought it was a great idea. Crowdfund to create jobs for Mardi Gras artists because they were getting laid off as the parades were canceled. And basically two months, we've raised $300,000 and put 48 people to work and also created a lot of Mardi Gras magic. Usually, all the floats will be going down St. Charles Avenue under the beautiful oak trees, but now, in Floats of the Oaks, they're here in City Park. This is the art the house floats are based on. Now, these are huge, but some of the house floats are pretty huge, too. We came up with Women of Light because during this pandemic time, there's been a lot of darkness, so that we wanted to really share the light with so many other people. And you have That's names so of all these wonderful women who have helped change the world. It's been just phenomenal just to see what a small little idea has grown into in the whole city. It's the artist that really brings the vision into a reality. So with this, this has been able to put them back to work. There's enough room for every single artist. I've made more money in six weeks than I did all year. It's a beautiful way for us to take what on its face is a terrible situation, COVID and carnival, and actually transform it into something inspiring and beautiful. This is one of my favorite houses because it celebrates, well, the important healthcare workers and all the nurses that took care of us, but it also celebrates the beauty of the float artists. This has been the first time in Mardi Gras history where all of the Mardi Gras artists has come together to help each other out. We may not have a parade, we still have our art. We feel needed. We feel like this is the thing that's going to kind of hold people through this difficult time. I don't think House Floats is going anywhere. I think it's here to stay. <laughs> That's what we love about New Orleans. We're given adversity, we turn it into something great. Such creativity on full display there. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. This furniture store was turned into a temporary shelter for those without power in the city of Houston, so often called the energy capital of the world. Our thoughts are certainly with the people still powerless tonight. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us and have a great night.
know what happened, and I 